Grace and peace to you as we gather this morning for worship. I'm Reverend Diane Rue, uh, pleased to be serving this congregation of St. Paul's United Methodist Church here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I want to begin with a couple of thank yous to uh, folks who are helping to lead this morning. Reverend Jim Kellerman, a retired pastor uh, that is related to our congregation, uh, brings a message for us today. And we also hear from a young one among us, Joseph, who is going to lead us today um, in learning and saying uh, together, praying together the Lord's Prayer. I do want to make a couple of announcements. First, uh, every year at St. Paul's, we have a giving tree that uh, we help to provide gifts and needs for people in our community through the Salvation Army. This year we've chosen a number of families again, and um, we have in our Sunday morning communication and on our website an easy way for you to sign up to uh, help the families instead of tags on the tree. Uh, there are uh, those same tags are listed in that website. It's very easy uh, to do and to sign up there for the gifts that you would want to purchase. Um, and the times to have them back and everything is, is all there. If you need any help though, feel free to call the office and um, Kathy can uh, help you sign up or if you would rather uh, give money to our Good Samaritan Fund uh, through check uh, that we would use to purchase for you so you would not need to go uh, into the stores. So uh, we still want to uh, 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 carry on that ministry but we've uh, uh, designed a safe way for you to do that. So please, again, call if you have any questions. And also just a reminder that Advent, the first Sunday of Advent, is the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. And as part of our Advent services together, we will be uh, lighting the Advent candle as we always do. Um, and we're encouraging everyone to have their own Advent candle, that we might light uh, those candles in our homes as well as uh, here in worship uh, together. So I'm hoping that some of you have uh, Advent candles. If you don't, perhaps you can, uh, might want to purchase some your own, of your own. Uh, we are going to be providing candles and an Advent wreath for our Sunday school families that we're preparing and uh, you'll get some more details on uh, how you can, how you'll receive those. Um, but uh, we may have a few more of those as well for uh, some of you who may want to do that and aren't able to get others on your own. So again, uh, just contact our office and we can uh, help arrange that for you. But at this time, I would like us to uh, listen uh, as we learn and are reminded how to pray uh, by Joseph this morning. Hello everybody, today we're going to be talking about praying. You see I've got my hands in my praying way, so let's say the Lord's Prayer with me. 
Are you ready? You know what? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking to you guys and telling you how to do it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Okay, everybody. Now you say it, and I say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now, you can say this any time you want. Supper time, dinner, dinner, dinner time, bedtime, snack time, basement, time with your own dad. You can help mom do the dishes whenever you want. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. I do want to share joys and concerns um, as then Lisa will lead us in prayer. Begin with the joys. Um, Rob Stevens celebrated a birthday last Monday on November 9th and Janet Stevens celebrates a birthday Saturday, November 14th. Uh, Mary Rather will be celebrating a birthday uh, Monday, November 16th. And Lynn Burnt celebrates on Saturday, November 21st. So lots of birthdays uh, to celebrate. We uh, wish God's blessings upon each and every one of you in this uh, year ahead. We have a number of folks to pray for um, who are in need. We want to uh, remember the family of Lorraine Lauscher. Lorraine did pass away in hospital after a long, hard battle with this COVID virus. Um, so we will have a memorial service for her uh, sometime when it is safe to do so. Um, but we want to continue praying for uh, her daughter Sherry and other family members who um, are just so heartbroken that they were unable to be with her throughout this time um, as um, um, neither were those of us as clergy. So we just... Uh, uh, pray for those who uh, mourn her passing in ways that uh, are deep and raw and just really, really hard. And we, we give thanks, oh God, for nurses who are journeying with uh, so many in this way. Prayers for Lori Verbort, who is starting a new chemo uh, regiment uh, this week. We want to pray for uh, Fred Monroe, who now does have... Uh, possibility of his heart surgery taking place on December 1st. He does have a number of tests that need to uh, keep on schedule and go well in order for him to hold that date, but we, he asks for prayers uh, for that whole process for him. And at the time of this taping, we just, I heard from Merle and Kathy Colburn, who've been praying for uh, their son, Kurt, who is hospitalized uh, with COVID, and it is my understanding that they just received word that he is needing to go on a ventilator at this time. So uh, please keep Kurt and his wife Tracy. She too has COVID, but she's at home and, and um, doing well. But uh, prayers needed for Kurt Colburn. So let's come before God in a time of prayer together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for all your good gifts made manifest to us in the beauty of creation. The mysterious workings of the Holy Spirit and the power of your word made flesh 
in Jesus Christ. In this fraught and anxious season, we commend our communities and nation to your merciful care. Grant all who have been entrusted with authority the spirit of wisdom and understanding to know and do your will and the courage to serve the people as lovers of justice and truth. Guide us all to work humbly, collaboratively, courageously, and with mercy for the healing of our nation and for the safety, welfare, and dignity of all our citizens. Throughout our country and the world, as we continue to struggle with the coronavirus, we pray for healing of the sick and those who care for them. We pray for the dying and those who seek to accompany them. We pray for the ability to work together to protect and strengthen our communities and economies. And we pray for all who struggle with loneliness and isolation. Finally, gracious God, we pray that you be with each one of us and with all of us in the ways that you know we need you most. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm 138. I give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day that I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O God, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he, he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. I imagine that many of you know the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. <clears throat> Bonhoeffer was a, um, a German pastor, Lutheran pastor, a, a theologian uh, in the 30s and 40s in Germany. And uh, he was, uh, in, in, in his pastoring, uh, at that very moment that there was a rising presence of what was the German National Socialist Party, which we would identify as a, a Nazi presence. And as they took power and created a totalitarian government and, and imposed a theological framework upon the churches, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and many other clergy and uh, faculty professors and laity went underground because they would not acquiesce to a theology that allowed for the destruction of an entire population of Jews or for anybody who was different uh, in, in, in color or voice or, or with special need, whatever it was, uh, 
they could not allow for that to be an acceptable understanding of the way life is shared. And so they resisted uh, that, motion, that motion in the, uh, that was happening in Germany at the time. And, and going underground, they, they spoke out about it. They found ways to resist it. Uh, over time, as, as things occurred in, in, uh, over the couple of years that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was doing this, uh, eventually, uh, in his participation in the underground, he became captured and sentenced to death and was uh, sent to a concentration camp, a prison camp, a death camp. And that's where Dietrich Bonhoeffer took up the calling that was his heart. He was a pastor. And so in the middle of a, of a place of darkness, of hopelessness, of despair, Dietrich Bonhoeffer discovered that he was still pastoring. And he would preach the word of hope. He would pray with people. He would cry with people. He would laugh with people. He would do whatever he needed to do to spend his time, his life, with the people that he was living with even in the midst of what was abject poverty because of the deprivation of resources and the intention of killing them eventually anyway. All these people who understood that uh, death was only a day away for many of them, uh, they found Bonhoeffer's pastoral presence significant for them. And, and even on the night before his own execution, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would, would uh, offer a service of hope and promise and grace, and people were touched. One of those who, who was uh, touched by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in that situation and who was able to sustain, be sustained in it and eventually escape from it would write of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that he was, he was the kind of person who would would bring an atmosphere of happiness and joy into, e into every incident, even the least of incidences. And, and he had uh, a sense of gratitude for the very fact of just being alive. And then he would say, this was one of the few people he had ever met for whom God was alive and always near. That's saying something about being a pastor and about being one who understands how you connect God to people. But you hear that Bonhoeffer does it as this man acknowledges it by gratitude. Gratitude for God in the midst of what is a dark and deadly place. Gratitude even in the face of death. He brings gratitude for the life that has been given to him and the opportunity he's had to be there. It, gratitude is his way of understanding that God is present even in that moment. Gratitude is our acknowledgement that God is always alive and always near. He's not alone in having that perception. Uh, we hear the text being read from the Psalter, from the Psalms, and, uh, and we hear King David's voice, who is offering up thanksgiving to God in, in high praise and acknowledging that he walks in dark places, but knowing that God is walking with him in those places. We know that, that the reference is, we're not sure exactly the specific reference to which uh, uh, David is referring, but, but we recognize that David was surrounded by enemies. There were enemies that he had been fighting all his life as a warrior, enemies from without who wanted to come back in and destroy Israel. And there were enemies even within his own family and his own politic that wanted to overthrow him from inside. He was constantly under threat and darkness that he had to walk in the middle of all the time. And then there was his own sinful nature, his own understanding of, the, of his own brokenness that, that is uh, historic for us and understood by us. And, and yet in the middle of the darkness, the muck and the mire of life that he knows, he says, thanks be to God in high moments, because I know God is walking with me even in the shadowed places. 
How many psalms does he write that have that same context about it? Some, I imagine about 12 years ago now, um, a doctor, uh, Sonia uh, Liba, I'm going to mess the name up here, it's a Liba, Mouse, Liba Mursky, uh, Liba Mursky, that's it, Liba Mursky, uh, ha had collected 20 years of psychological data that she had been gathering and, and wrote a book called The How of Happiness, What Makes Us Happy? And in that process of figuring out and looking at the data, she discovered there were three realities that we needed to recognize. One is, the first one was that, the, that uh, happiness is in part genetic. We inherit a sense of joy, of happiness. It's, it's in our chromosomes. It's what we are born with. Our inclination is natural to us. Therefore, there are some people who are just naturally born Eeyores who have this sense of dark cloud and, and the sadness and the weariness of life that is always about them. But there are also those who are born as Tiggers who are up and bouncing and joyful all the time and, uh, and it's an effervescent joy that cannot be stopped. You recognize that those are two extremes of the same continuum and that many of us live in the, somewhere in between them, but it's genetic. It's, an, it's something we inherit. And then she says, there's also a segment of, of our happiness that comes by way of circumstances. Things that happen to us, things that are given to us that, that change something and, and bring us joy. Now for, now for us, I would imagine in this setting, uh, we would say it's probably that the uh, Packers win the Lombardi Trophy uh, would certainly cause a level of happiness for some of us. Um, but I also understand, uh, at least in my life, that uh, joy comes and happiness is elevated in the circumstances of, of knowing I get to see granddaughters or grandsons and share in their life, and that is joy. Circumstances that are given to me that change the reality of my perception of life. But she says, the, the, the honest reality is that in terms of the perceptions and the data that she collects, that's only 10% of happiness is affected by circumstances. That's not very much. So if you do the math, you recognize that there's another 40% that's there that she says comes by choice. It's what you choose to do, what you choose to think, what you choose to have as your attitude that brings you happiness and joy. It's the choices we make that can, can affect how we are, how we experience life. And, and, and she goes on to say, here are a list of possibilities of things that you can do that will affect those kind of changes and that kind of experience of, of joy. And she, she talks about things like um, uh, practicing, uh, you know, spiritual uh, practices of, uh, of prayer and uh, uh, scripture reading or poetry or, or um, it might be yoga for you. Whatever that is, it is a spiritual context that centers you. Those things help you. Or it might be your willingness to pr practice the gift of forgiveness brings you joy. The gift of forgiveness. But she says, the reality is that the, on that list she creates, the very first one she names, the one that dominates them all, is gratitude. Gratitude is the first thing she sees that changes our attitude about life, our sense of, of happiness and joy that comes to us in, uh, in any moment. Gratitude. It's the affirmation that in this moment, we find pleasure, we find joy, we find a presence that, that moves through our lives and it gives to us a sense of gratitude. It is God's presence. Now she goes on to talk about how that affects our offering gratitude to others and, uh, and, and affecting, uh, allowing this kind of waving motion to move out beyond us so that others experience 
that, that joy as we offer them gratitude. But at the heart of it is this sense that gratitude is the way we declare that in every moment, in any kind of reality, the, when we offer gratitude, we are saying God is present, we are not alone, God is alive, God is very near. Gratitude. That's, that's the kind of philosophy that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, was living in a concentration camp in, a, in the darkness of his reality. That's what, that's what uh, you see happening to uh, David as he moves through the darkness of his days. And yet in it all, they find that gratitude is the anchor by which they identify and understand life. And it changes how they see the way the world comes to them because they recognize it as something that God is touching, God is offering. Gratitude allows them to affirm that, to name that, to choose to alter the world by naming God in the present moment. The truth is that as you do that, you recognize it does in fact affect community. Bonhoeffer's community is changed because he dares to bring gratitude for, for life lived in that moment in, in, a, in a dark and, and horrible place, and, and people find hope in it. They hear a word of, of a presence in it, and their lives are changed and sustained even though they face death on a daily basis. You hear, as, as uh, King David writes this psalm today, you recognize that in the ancient tradition of kings, he represents the people of God. He is the people of God. So when he says, give, you know, let us praise God, give thanks to God, he's identifying it for himself. It's a very personal thing, but he does it on behalf of the whole community. And so he's saying to the whole community, we walk in darkness, but we have this God who walks with us through this darkness. And our gratitude reflects this God who we know with confidence is here. And, and it affects his community. And you realize that because that psalm gets collected with all these other psalms, and, and in several hundred years, his descendants will find themselves being exiled. And what, what books do they take with them? What do they read? What do they sing? These songs, songs that say, praise God, thanks God, Gratitude for God, naming God in the midst of the places where they feel isolated and alone. And, and hundreds of years later than that, there will be a, uh, the entire population of Jews in Jerusalem will be driven into the diaspora. The dispersion will be driven out of Jerusalem itself. And these are the songs they will take with them into the world to say, God is with us. God is not leaving us alone. God is walking in these dark places. You hear this? The, the community is being affected by the gratitude of, of David's voice, but being sung now for the whole body of people. And here we are, thousands of years later, still, still singing that same psalm, still hearing it read, still naming it as, as our psalm, and it affects us, and we are changed. It's a gift of community that, is, that evolves because gratitude names God in our midst. God is present for us. God is alive and always very near. I recognize that you and I live in, in dark times in many ways. I can't say they're the darkest times. I, there are so many places across human history that bear darkness, but ours are dark enough. We live in a, a world of politic that is divisive and, um, and even as we wait for the voices of promise and change and hope and civility, we recognize that we still live in a, in a very torn society. We live in a society that continues to deal with and struggle with its sense of injustice and, and trying to get a handle on that and alter the realities of, of our neighbors and, our, and the people we share life with. And we recognize that that's still out there for us to, to, uh, to have to manage and, and, and come to grips with and come to confession about and, and alter life. 
that that's part of the darkness we bear. And then, and then you put on top of all of that our, uh, 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 a pandemic that uh, has driven our economy down, has uh, caused loss of jobs, has uh, caused our students, our children, our grandchildren to struggle in, in school. Some thrive in the technology, but I'm guessing most are struggling because they miss the, the, the full nature of the educational reality that allows for socialization, and they miss the, the context of, of being able to find personal one-on-one -on -one time with, with teachers who can look over their shoulders and walk them through the learning process and the growing process. It does not work the same way. And so we feel this darkness of, of that pandemic moving about us. And yet we come into this month and we say, as we say every Sunday, we are grateful for God who walks with us. We are grateful for God who lives among us. We are grateful for a God who does not leave us alone, even in these dark places. <clears throat> that doesn't mean the, the situation changes and suddenly all things are healed or suddenly all reality is, uh, is, is altered and justice is suddenly given to us as gift. There are things we will have to work at hard for a long time. But we will not walk alone. We will walk with a God who is always with us. Our gratitude tells us we are grateful for a God who lives in our midst, a God who is alive, a God who is always very near. Thanks be to God. Amen.